8 a.m. here in the in the Pacific. Uh, I mean, sorry, in the West Coast. Um, and happy to have a couple of gentlemen that are going to be talking or introducing uh, a valuable resource for for exporters, importers. Uh, as you guys know, we have a marketplace where uh, we promote uh, products of uh, businesses that are doing business in Latin America and vice versa, Latin America in the U.S. So the topic that we're going to address today is very important for many of you. And I know we have been getting calls, you know, over the last few weeks from people that are considering uh, going into international markets. So we're going to be talking about different payment forms and stuff. And there is a link provided at the, uh, at the bottom of this um, live that when you click on it, you're going to go to uh, Bali Bank and they have multiple resources there for you guys to uh, uh, keep digging a little deeper. But thank you so much, uh, Ralph and Dan. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. <clears throat> so, um, yes, I'm Dan Facina. I'm uh, one of the uh, division heads at at Valley Bank, and Valley Bank's a, um, a bank headquartered in uh, New Jersey. And so uh, we're in northern Jersey, and we're covering, you know, the metro New York uh, area. And uh, our, you know, our bank is across, you know, of course, across the whole tri-state that we're working geographically speaking as well. So uh, I'm heading up FX uh, sales for the bank. And, um, <clears throat> and I have uh, Ralph Pacino, who is on my team, who is really our our trade finance, import, export, uh, you know, commodities uh, expert uh, crossing uh, across all those different lines. And so, you know, with foreign exchange and trade finance uh, very much, um, you know, commingled together. So we wanted to join this uh, call as a team. But uh, without further ado, I'll turn that over to uh, Ralph Pacino. Thank, Thank you. you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Friday. I, I love the opportunity to, to talk about trade. And a bit of my, my background is I work for Dan Fasina Valley Bank. And uh, my background is sales, product development, and operations. So your listeners shouldn't be adverse to challenging me with some questions uh, on the nitty gritty, roll up your sleeves type stuff. So uh, I like workshops and thrive in that type of environment. So to kind of kick it off, most companies who are either engaged in international trade or beginning to enter that world, sadly are ill-equipped to do so for the following reasons. And number one, it's basic human nature, human response is fear, right? But the dilemma for them too is the only way to grow is internationally because the domestic market is, is pretty much dried up. So you've got that factor, not to start off with negatives, but the next point is most exporters, and I'll focus on importers as well, but most exporters are looking for that silver bullet, that one ironclad way and, and, and risk mitigant, but there is no silver bullet in, in everything, in anything we're buying or selling and especially with international trade. So it's, it's understanding that every deal has a certain level amount of risk. And for the exporter, you're asking the question, am I making it easy to do business with me? Because think about it, you're competing on a global basis. You're not you know, in a certain area, a certain neighbor, geographic region, you're competing on a global basis. So it's important to understand that from, from your perspective, from the exporter perspective, are other countries, other exporters, my competitors in other countries, are they making it easier to buy from them or from you? And conversely, on the importer side, how, how reliable is my supplier? Uh, do they need financing? Can I delay payment while I sell my products or services? So can I buy this? on a uh, on a basis where sort of like you you look at and it all goes back to common sense by the way so if you're looking to buy or sell you look at retailers when you go into a best buy or any other retailer and you're buying a you know, piece of equipment expensive equipment you're getting terms right so that same philosophy that same strategy 
could work when you're an importer exporter because you could buy that television or that stereo equipment and you have it and not have to pay for it for a certain period of time. And since some of your listeners, right, and I'm going to take this little bit of a diversion, but since your listeners are maybe buying or selling in Latin and South America, you have to also look at rate differential. So right now, still, <laughs> it's cheaper to borrow money in the U.S. than it is in other markets. So those are the questions that you would be asking your bank, your finance company. And that brings me to my other point. I'm working with the company right now, and it's a small company, and I'm teaching them to build partnerships. So as part of any international transaction, right, we're looking at building a team, and it's your local team, your bank, your freight forwarder, logistics company, you may have a consultant that you're working with, local trade organizations, but it's important that you seek out those individuals and those resources to help you grow your business. So looking at developing an international sales plan. So, right, you're an exporter, importer, and saying, here's this banker telling me to go out and hire more people. No. When I say developing an international sales plan or when you're looking at uh, enhancing an existing international sales plan, uh, do you have an, an international sales plan that's going to help you grow your business? Again, going back to, am I making it easy to do business with my customer or my supplier? But namely, for the, for the purpose of this podcast, we're going to touch upon specific international methods of payment. And we're just going to touch upon the four basic methods of payment because each method of payment warrants its own seminar, podcast, workshop. So I'm going to turn it back to the presentation and we can get the presentation on the screen and we can go through the international methods of payment. And I, and I apologize because for some, this is going to be very basic parochial information. For some, it may be an eye-opening experience to say, wow, I've never thought about that. But I did see we had a question, so um, should we address that question? Uh, we can address it uh, after your presentation. Uh, okay. Okay, Ralph. fantastic. So for the first slide, right, is cash in advance. Easiest methods of payment, right? So we look at this screen and go through this. This, this is probably the most important slide of the presentation, right? You're looking at how you're going to develop your international sales plan. And this applies to both importer and exporter, right? So you're looking at the lowest risk and highest risk. So where do you fit in this transaction? And again, as an exporter, you want to look at not only you, but your importer, your, your customer. For the importer, you want to look at your supplier. So this slide is one that is, I think this is a great takeaway because this goes through every possible methods of payment. Now we did include standby letters of credit, but that's kind of a different animal. We could address that if you want to touch upon that. But for the purpose of this podcast, uh, I'm going to focus on just the commercial side of the business, commercial letters of credit, documents against payment, cash against documents and all that. But next up is one slide that you would look at on, on the cash and advance side. Uh, so if you want to advance to that next slide, uh, you look at this and say, hmm, this is kind of an easy one to understand, right? So for most exporters that I work with, they focus in on cash in advance. Hey, I want to get my money quick. But it goes back to my early point, right? Am I making it easy to do business with my customer? Is my customer going to do business with another exporter? So you look at this and you can say, well, I produce a very special type of product or service. Now, for example, I work with, I worked with a company that's in the telecommunication industry 
and they do a specific product for telecommunications. They also do business in parts of the world that they pretty much own, Solomon Islands, Belize. So I mistakenly didn't do my pre-call work when I called on this company and I started spouting, well, you're making a mistake by offering cash in advance, right? So we're all subject to life and learn, right? And they came back to me and said, well, in our case, we don't have to offer extended payment terms or financing or any other type of, of specialty product. We're the only game in town. That's not going to be the case, right? In your case, this may not be uh, you know, prevalent. So when I, when I go out and do these workshops and I work with exporters, I ask them these questions. Do you know your competitor? Are you working with the logistics company? Are you working with the bank? And we look at exporters and say, what are the risks, all right? So in a cash in advance, there's virtually no risk, right? The pros are payment before shipment eliminates risk of non-payment. But what a big con, right? May lose customer to competitors over payment terms, right? This is a great opportunity for you to stop and look at your website. Right? Does your website have specific payment instructions? Or does your website pretty much open it up to say, hey, we'll do business with anyone around the globe. First off, are you willing to quote in your customer's currency? Now, for those of you going, well, we don't want to get into the foreign exchange business. Nope. For every risk, there's a mitigant. So banks have foreign exchange traders. So in essence, you're not subject to any of the currency risk. So for example, you want a dual invoice. You're doing business in Japan. You want to do yen and US dollar. You go to your foreign exchange person at the bank and say, I have an opportunity to sell to Japan or any other part of the world. And that foreign exchange person will give you the equivalent of the yen versus US dollars. So you're not subject if you're doing, if, you, if you're in the forward market, if you're anticipating X amount of payments over the months, you could lock into that rate. And what did you just do? Bingo, you've just made it easier for your customer to do business with you. Now, the other piece of this is we're used to trade insurance, right? Insurance that car life, whatever did you know that there's trade credit insurance there's insurance out there that could help you with working capital one of the biggest issues that i have with working with exporters is to get them bankable right they come to me they've got this great product they have customers they don't have the working capital to either buy more of these products, buy raw material, or they just need working capital to produce the product here. So again, as I said earlier, each one of these slides, right, payment term, warrant its own trade seminar, trade workshop. So you look at the amount of time we spent just on cash in advance, a very simple, perceptually simple uh, payment term, we're already talking about on the export side, maybe insuring your buyers. Now, later on, when we get into open account, I think that's gonna really show you why that's important. But for an exporter, that's maybe a new to export. Well, if you're new to export, the US government, the Export Import Bank of the United States will only finance you if you have three years financial, if you have a track record on doing export business, international business. The advantage of ensuring your receivables, right? It makes you not only more competitive internationally, but you have that insurance document in your hands. So now when you go to a bank and say, well, I've got this great opportunity, great story to tell, but I don't have any way to finance it. You could go now to multiple banks and say, well, wait a second, my buyers are insured. 
And for a bank to have insured receivables, that means that these receivables, these insured receivables, this business is insured, right? Which means there's a 90% typical 90% coverage on this. Now that's good for you, right? The exporter, but you can monetize. And when we say monetize, you could bring that insurance policy to a bank, to multiple banks. Now you've got banks competing for your business, right? You could say, well, wait a second. I've got an insurance policy that's going to protect me 90% against loss. But I could take this insurance policy and name you ABC Bank as loss payee or beneficiary, meaning that you can put a line in place secured by you, this insurance document, and now you're covered 90%. Well, are you willing to take the 10% risk on me? Oh, no? Okay, well, I'll go to another bank to do this. Or you can say, well, how much are you willing to advance on this insurance? 90%? What about 100%? Could you give me that 10% uh, risk? Or would you take that 10% risk? Yes or no? So this, again, we spent a lot of time just talking about cash in advance, but you could turn cash in advance into a foreign currency opportunity. Again, talk about building a team. You've got your bank, not only your commercial loan officer like Dan Fasina and I, but you've got the bank, their foreign exchange group that's working with you on dual invoicing, US dollar, foreign exchange. And now you have a, you know, Valley Bank has its own insurance group. So now we've engaged our insurance team to help you look at trade credit insurance. Very simply, it's just like buying life, car, auto insurance, same kind of deal. The next slide is we start getting into the different, the nuances of international trade, uh, open account, opposite end of the spectrum now for the exporter open account, we talked about having this trade credit insurance, right? As a financing tool. Now you have this trade credit insurance as a way for you to quote open account terms as the exporter, correct? So it's, it, it's providing a dual opportunity, working capital. Your conversations with your customers, and again, I go back to the website, your website as an international company, first of all, you know, very the minimal is you should have an, a, a, comp, a, a website that shows that you're an international company. As, as benign and as strange as this may sound, a bunch of flags making the, the, the website look international and not be subjected to any specific payment term. You're open to do business with virtually any company around the world, provided you've taken these steps to mitigate your risk. So this is open account is one that most banks won't talk about because this takes away from the traditional bank services. I can almost envision some of your listeners like look, shaking their head going, yeah, banks don't like to talk about open account because it takes away from the letter of credit or collection business. But the way we think is more long-term. If I could help you grow your international business, you're gonna do more business with the bank. But the open account business is interesting in terms of when you insure these receivables, is now when you've got a company on the phone, say you're doing business in Brazil, and you have a trade credit insurance policy you can talk to this Brazilian company, do a credit check, and a little bit of a side on the credit check, make sure you're using a reputable credit uh, reporting agency. And from what I've learned, most of your local chamber of commerces have relationships with companies like COFAS, uh, Veritas, that could give you a good international uh, say, uh, credit report. Dun & Bradstreet's great, but they're more focused on, on the domestic side, but you could balance both. But again, to my point about when you're entertaining, 
doing business with your Brazilian customer, you could get as much information on this, this Brazilian customer and come back to them and say, let me check with my insurance company to see if they would insure you. So again, you're looking twofold. You have a relationship with an insurance company. Your insurance company is doing a credit check on your buyer, on your Brazilian buyer. So you've got a double credit check going. You've got not only your Cofas or Veritas or Dun & Bradstreet, but you're also getting a credit rating from your insurance company. Your insurance company may come back and say, well, we like this particular Brazilian company, but we'll only insure 80% of it. Again, you've got your relationship with your bank. You go back to your bank, strategize and say, hey, we've got 80% guarantee on this insurable, receivable. Would you finance the 20%? Uh, the bigger picture is now you've taken maybe your small export company and you're competing with companies that may be offering less attractive terms. Maybe they're offering letter of credit terms or documentary collection terms or cash against documents. Now you're pretty much in the big leagues. You're expanding your business globally and original point, making it easy for your customer to do business with you. So again, applicability, it's in secure trading relationships, in competitive markets. The only way you can get into that particular market is by offering open account terms. If you open, if again, the risk on that is if you don't have a mitigant, that insurance, the buyer could default on payment obligation. And again, after shipment of goods, pros, it's a competitive tool, establish and maintain a successful trade relationship. My, my point earlier about uh, an international sales plan or preparing an international sales plan. I've gotten feedback when doing this live that, yeah, that's great if you're a large company. How do I hire someone? What do I do? How do I make this a priority in my company with limited resources? Well, you could hire college students to do that out of an international program from college. Uh, you know how, how motivated they are. To, to work in an international company. Um, I knew a company, a publicly traded company uh, that I've worked with, that they've established their international trade salesperson from an administrative assistant that just took an interest in doing international trade. And this person went on to become their international salesperson. She loved to beat up banks because she knew all of it. She went to all these seminars and podcasts and got to understand this and would challenge banks on what we're talking about today. Uh, so again, I think it's important to uh, understand your business, but the question that I've gotten is I don't want to assign a specific person to be, to develop this international sales plan, to look at each payment term and do an assessment. And the other way to look at this too is to set thresholds, your risk appetite. So if you're an exporter importer and say, in order for us to do cash in advance, we would set a threshold of everything under $5,000. We'll take the, we'll take the $5,000 risk. And then you can just increase the amount on each of these four payment methods and say, well, if it's over a certain amount, I'm gonna to have to accept a letter of credit or do cash against documents. But again, that's an individual conversation with your bank, your freight forwarder, your consultant, and that whole team of individuals. I would encourage you though, to work with, if you have a relationship with the, with the Department of Commerce, wherever you are locally, is I would encourage you to work with them on a development of a website. And you, I believe they offer these classes and, and seminars and you could get it relatively inexpensively. So on the next slide is one that is, th this has to be the most misunderstood 
payment method, right? Documentary collections. This is typically what happens behind the scenes when a letter of credit goes wrong, right? But this in and of itself is a great payment method because maybe you don't need as an exporter, you don't need that level of protection that a letter of credit is going to give you. Or as an importer, you may know your supplier, but you need some proof of shipment. Maybe you're financing, you're doing purchase order financing, or your bank is asking for that underlying transaction to finance. And this is where it's a great tool for you to use to go back to your bank and say, well, I want to finance my international transaction, but I may not have trade credit insurance. I may not have all the sophisticated tools, but hey, I could prove to you that I have this transaction. And for the importer, right? So importer is that the bills of lading, right? Now, not airway bills or, or truck bills of lading, but the onboard ocean bill of lading is a title document, which means that as the importer, and we're always talking about mitigating risk and, and getting the bank to understand your business. If I'm an importer and I want maybe purchase order financing, I need to finance this transaction. The collecting bank, which would be the issuing bank uh, for a letter of credit, but in the collection, you know, banks banks need to make it a little bit. We need to change and differentiate the product. But in essence, the importer is the, the buyer's bank, the importer's bank. And in that case, the bills of lading can be consigned directly to the bank, which means as you're looking at that trade flow, the exporters presenting documents to their bank. Their bank's presenting documents to, if you're the importer I'm speaking with now, uh, to your bank. And that bill, those bills of lading control title. And that title document is the full set of those onboard ocean bills of lading. It's what you need to pick up the goods, which you just bought, right? So in essence, you're taking that bill of lading and you're saying to the bank very similar to what you're doing with insurance right you're telling the bank i'm going to assign that insurance to you well, in this case you're assigning that bill of lading to your bank your bank owns the goods now we can get into a higher level conversation and say how how do we perfect that collateral is that collateral important to us well again it's it's another risk mitigant that you present to the bank and again, for the exporter exposed to more risk, DC terms, documentary collection, or some call it cash against documents, but they're less complex and cheaper than a letter of credit to the importer. Why? Because there's no underlying line of credit. There's no credit. The bank, you're not using your bank's balance sheet because on the import side, that's where all the domestic financing is happening. You're using your bank's balance sheet, right, to buy your goods or services. So it's, it's on the collection side, you're not using that balance sheet for the bank. So therefore, it's less expensive. If you're looking at costs, I'm going to give you kind of a broad range. Documentary collections, and again, these are strictly documentary collections. You're looking at anywhere from $100 to $150 per all in for these transactions. Again, a great alternative to LCs. Other pros, banks assistance in obtaining payments. So this is kind of like if you're an, you're an exporter, you're selling product. This is this is putting your bank, you know, your bank is the muscle to collect that payment. So you're using the bank and their correspondent banking network and again Another piece of this is your bank's corresponding network, because as you're an exporter, does your bank have a relationship with the exporting bank, the foreign bank? And most banks would have a corresponding banking relationship with either the importer's bank and or the exporter's bank. The cons are bank's role is limited and no guarantee of payment. But again, if you're the importer, you've already proven that there's a mitigant 
with having the bills of lading consigned over to the bank. And banks do not verify the accuracy of the documents, which, again, you're looking at these two cons. Do you need that? Less expensive. You've done your due diligence. You've done the best you can do in terms of, of mitigating that risk. Maybe you just want to monetize. Again, we get back to the word monetize. You're an importer. You want to get paid quicker. You could show the bank that there's an underlying transaction with a, with a bill of lading, onboard bill of lading, hence financing the transaction. Next up, uh, next slide is letters of credit. Now, again, I explained that each one of these slides weren't their own hour, two, three hour, you know, bankers can go on and on. Uh, but letters of credit, you know, get a bad rap. And I can spend two hours on this, and I promise you I'm not. Uh, but letters of credit get a bad rap because, again, I've been doing this for almost 40 years. And from the time I, I started to, to, to do LCs to even to this day, I've been hearing about the demise of using LCs. And in my opinion, is they're just not used correctly, right? So if you're an exporter, structuring these these guaranteed instruments it's important as and i'm going to take it from the perspective first of an exporter correct so you're designing a contract right a letter of credit is a contract between from the export side right you're the exporter your customer right so you've exhausted or you've gone through your international sales plan and said okay anything over five thousand dollars to fifteen thousand we're going to require a documentary collection or cash against documents now these thresholds are kind of fluid so it's going to be up to you anything over maybe fifteen thousand up that maybe you can't get trade credit insurance for your customer you're going to use a letter of credit now i go back to the website I've seen websites where exporters say, yeah, if you want to do business with us, you can do business with us only using a letter of credit. How much of that business just you've just shut out? You've just completely eliminated 80% of your opportunity. But if your website, again, goes through the narrative of, you know, we're looking to expand international business, we entertain, give us your information, we'll do our research, and we'll make it effective to sell and, and to buy from you. So in this case, when you're looking at a letter of credit, another key takeaway from this, I believe, is you're in control as an exporter. You can control what's in that contract, what's in that letter of credit. So number one, your bank, right? Even though you're the recipient of this letter of credit, your customer's bank, will be issuing this letter of credit, the importer's bank. So I've gotten many uh, in-person uh, debates on this where I've had feedback where an exporter said, I have no control over how that letter of credit is written. That's nonsense. Absolute not. You're, you're in control as the exporter to go and utilize your bank and say, I want to put together a draft LC, again, no cost, no cost, because the wrap on the LC is it's expensive. Well, it's expensive because exporters typically say, hey, to the export importer, look, just send me a letter of credit. Well, that LC has to be amended. Uh, that letter of credit has to be modified, amended. And, and you're getting nickel and dimes for a relatively inexpensive instrument. And the question is, so Ralph, how expensive or inexpensive is this instrument? A commercial documentary letter of credit should cost you no more than 1%. And if you're the exporter or importer, you would typically pay all of your bank fees. Now, conversely, on the import side, now I'm buying products. And typically, maybe your supplier is asking for a letter of credit. Question is, why is your supplier asking for a letter of credit? Do they not trust you? 
Or, and this is a question importers rarely ask, is they just automatically assume that my supplier is asking for a letter of credit because they don't trust me. Well, the other reason is they may looking, they may be looking to finance using that letter of credit. So the way it works is the importer would have their bank issue the letter of credit in favor of the exporter. And that exporter can go into their bank and use that letter of credit for working capital. And again, you can do it on the reverse as well. If you ask these questions as the importer, now think about this, this should be in back of your mind. If I'm going to be using my line of credit to issue a letter of credit from my supplier purely for financing, I don't think I should pay for that issue. This is all part of the negotiation. Number one, you don't pay for the LC. Again, that's a negotiating tool. Number two is if you're an importer, you're importing apparel or I hate to use the word widgets. Every banker used the word widgets, but you're looking to, to maybe import pens. Well, you're going to import this product. And as soon as those documents arrive at the bank, you're going to have to pay for those pens. Well, you haven't sold those pens yet. So your position of strength in negotiation is, well, I'm helping you supplier finance this, these goods or services, but I'm not going to be able to sell these pens for 30, 60, 90, 120 days. I want extended payment terms. Back to my original point about buying a TV or whatever at Best Buy computer. Best Buy will give you 30, 60, 90, whatever, how much, maybe a year's financing. Well, banks will do the same. And quite frankly, banks, this is a great business for banks because we're, we're financing these transactions either on the import or export side. It shouldn't matter to your supplier if it's 30, 60, 90, 120 days because under a letter of credit, that letter of credit that's in favor of the exporter, right? There's a commitment to pay, not a promise to pay, like in a documentary collection or cash against document. There's a promise to pay. So documents are presented. You're not going to have to pay. You don't have to pay for those goods or services until you've already sold those pens or whatever, which again, totally is lacking in understanding LCs. When you look at the export side of the business, I know some of you are saying, Letters of credits are expensive, so we've just proven that constructed and, and negotiated correctly on the export side, they shouldn't be any more than 1%. But my documents are always discrepant, right? Which means that it's useless. That letter of credit, once there are problems, once there are discrepancies in that letter of credit, it becomes a documentary collection. Bank has no obligation to pay. It becomes a negotiation between you and your supplier, you and your customer. In order to, to mitigate, again, that risk is to get a draft of that letter of credit approved, making sure that both buyer and seller understand. Again, the most important part of this export transaction when you're doing letters of credit, now, I know ego-wise, banks like to be the primary driver in this, but your logistics company is the most important piece in making sure you get paid. An example is if you're working with the freight forwarder and you're doing export business and a high percentage of your documents are discrepant, either your bank is being too picky or your logistics company, they may not be preparing your documents correctly. So again, that's putting their feet to the fire to make sure that you have the, the logistics company or you have a processing piece and you can do this all electronically. There are companies out there where they prepare and present documents uh, electronically through the banks. So that's another option. If, Again, you're looking to maybe do 
um, expand your business. But most likely, if you're a new to export, you're going to work with a logis logistics company who may already have that software or who want to do this manually, which I think is perfectly acceptable. So that's kind of pre pre taking a complex, the con, complex and labor intensive, you pretty much want your bank to do, your bank and your freight forwarder to do all the work in a letter of credit transaction, right? Because what happens is most exporters that I work with, they've got the, they, you guys need to sell, not get involved in international trade, the nuances of documents. That should all be outsourced to your logistics company or your banker. Now, not to put any internal documentary people at your company, but if you're a large enough exporter, or if you want to make this a priority for your business, having a, an in-house international director is another option for you to go. So if you have a dedicated, or if you have someone that wants to do, that's either doing a treasury management uh, job, adding on international trade, that's perfectly acceptable. But again, for the purpose of this podcast, I want to make it easy for you to do business, not hiring new people and incur incurring additional expenses. So, you know, that's pretty much it. You know, I had to kind of give a high level uh, view of all this, but I believe you know that you have all the tools. You have the insurance tools outside of these payment methods from a bank. You've got the foreign exchange option is the most underutilized piece of this. There's a large company uh, that I worked with years ago that I approached this publicly traded company and I gave them this, this piece and I explained to them that they should be quote, dual invoicing. And they said their accounting system prevents them from, from doing dual invoicing. And this was a large publicly traded company. And that's when I first thought about how dire that situation, how ill-prepared U.S. companies are uh, for, for doing international trade. And I could take you to the Valley Bank Commercial Insight um, page. That's not only trade, two articles on trade, but there's information on foreign exchange, pandemic relief, uh, cannabis market, AI services. Uh, you know, cyber attacks, which I think is, you know, again, we're all pretty much worried uh, uh, about what's going on there. And lastly, the supply chain. I know that's kind of, uh, they say the elephant in the room. But lastly, the supply chain. I think the supply chain issue is going to be an ongoing issue. I can tell you that it's spotty. Uh, personally, my, my son ordered at a, a, a component for his uh, truck and it was supposed to be months but it just showed up yesterday and that's the kind of like surprise it's here type of uh, uh, situation we're in so again going to your logistics company they could give you a little bit more information than i'm giving you now but even they're kind of stymied by the supply chain disruptions you know of course inflation but hopefully we've given you the tools to, as a basis and you know, kind of giving you an idea that there are certain you know, options on each of these of the payment methods that you could explore. Thank you. Uh, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Thank you, Ralph. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I thought you were going to drop a golden nugget here, but you just drop a whole bunch of bombs of valuable information. Oh, well, that's good to know. <laughs> uh, we have a few questions and we still have a few minutes. Um, I want to oh, sure. be respectful of your time, but the qu the first question that we ask, and I don't know if you have any information about this, but it was from uh, Lirian and she asked if, uh, if natural body care products are thriving in international markets. Oh, that that's now I'll, I'll give you my other my other volunteer position is with score. So when somebody asks me a very specific question like that, every product would thrive. So 
what I would suggest, and I don't know her particular situation, but if she's just looking to get into the international arena and 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 not bankable or maybe not have the the wherewithal to do this, the liquidity to do this, I would definitely go to the, her local uh, score chapter for information. They do market research, but the general question is all products. I mean, if you find a niche, there should be no reason. You know, I, I worked with a company who was manufacturing chopsticks and exporting them to, so anything can be done. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, yep. Thank you so much. So there you go, uh, Lirian. We have another question. Well, uh, this is uh, uh, Ruben. He's asking if you can share your uh, contact information. Oh, that's an easy question. Did did somebody plant? Did Dan plant that? No. So of course, of course. It's, it's this Ru Ruben Ledesma. Oh, <laughs> sure. I how would I do that? Would I just uh, send it to you? And yeah, you you can say it, but we can also like add it after the uh, presentation in the description of the okay. video, so people yeah, can have it. Whatever way to do that. Yes. Um, why don't you why don't you give your email for now, uh, yeah. Ralph, so they sure. can contact you. It's uh, R. Bocino, one word, R B as in boy, O C C H I N O at valley.com. Perfect. And I love like how many times you mention uh, websites uh, throughout your your uh, presentation because that's the one thing that we have been promoting since, since 2008. We tell small businesses you must have mm -hmm. a website because it's, it's your uh, window to the world. You know, you can. You can get clients all over the world and all of a sudden, even someone that hasn't even think about exporting a product, they get an order from, you know, out of, out of the country and, and they get very excited. And that's thanks to the website. Well, and not it's, just their it's, customers, it's, but also their banks. It's really one of the first things that the banks look at to get an understanding of the company and how they're presenting themselves and what their you know products are. See? Some of the things that I mentioned, right, is part of that me standing in front of a room and trying to explain how to design a website and someone in back of the room raised their hand and said, no, no, no. All we did was put a bunch of flags around. <laughs> yeah. How can I've, I seen, argue I've seen with that. that. Yeah. And, and here I am explaining links. And I got in trouble because I was going a place where, you know, I was getting, and I'm glad this person said that. <laughs> so, um, yes. We have another question, like, um, in what areas do you guys serve as, as a bank? Because, you know, we have some folks, of course, in the, in the West Coast, California, Washington, and we have folks uh, that are going to be watching these presentations in the East Coast. So where, where can you serve? Yeah. Well, on, 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 you know, from a bank perspective, you know, our footprint would be the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Florida, Alabama, but Valley Bank just acquired uh, Bank Layumi USA. And so we've expanded our, expanded our footprint to Chicago, Illinois, um, you know, California. We also have a, a Dudley Ventures entity in, in Arizona. But when it comes to just uh, basic, you know, foreign exchange currency, or possibly some you know, trade options. Uh, we can look at that from you know pretty much anywhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great! Oh, and uh, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the uh, foreign uh, exchange traders because we had a question about that. Like, uh, can you elaborate more about the the, uh, the currency uh, situations? You gave a great example, but I don't know if you want to elaborate a little more. Yeah, on I that. think. I think what Ralph was touching on is that they have what they call a spot trade for foreign exchange, which is same day, right? You're just exchanging the currency. But the what Ralph was explaining is that you can kind of mitigate your risks by locking in your, your rate sometimes on mm -hmm. your currency. And that can go as far as, you know, 30 days, 60, 90, you know, six months out. And everything has a, a cost to it. It's an insurance, if you will, but there's a, a way to do that. And the dual invoicing, if you're invoiced in different currencies, you have the option to pay that way through your bank. And your bank doing your exchange for you could be a, a more cost-effective way versus, uh, you know, your 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 customer doing it or using their banks. Perfect. Um, let me let me do a follow-up. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to add to that. You know, don't be afraid to to find those people at the bank. So you're 
at the bank, your commercial loan officer is the kind of the quarterback of all this. So finding a foreign exchange trader and they, you know, they they love to strategize and talk about what where, what rates are doing. Um, so I encourage companies to to seek out the foreign exchange trader. Make sure they have a live trader to talk to a, a educated live trader to have these conversations with. Perfect. I'm sorry. Let me, let me do a let me do a quick follow up question because Ruben is uh, online right now and he's yeah. he's saying that he's in Oregon, but he has offices in Texas and Wyoming. And, and uh, he's asking if he can open an account with you guys and work remotely uh, with Bali. Well, I mean, that, that might be a little more difficult. Uh, it is out of our, our traditional footprint, but we do partner with other, other banks and, and companies okay. and we can probably help them along with that as well. Okay, perfect. So Ruben, we'll have the uh, contact information of Ralph and uh, Dan available uh, to you and then you can follow up with them to see how they can uh, help you out. Uh, we have another question about the uh, uh, trade credit insurance. And the question was in, in regards to uh, uh, recommendations like do you guys, because you mentioned that you have your own insurance department. Yes. So they're asking if, uh, if they can work with your insurance department or if you can recommend uh, companies yes. to work with. They can work with, if they're in, the footprint that we cover, and I'll let Dan elaborate. Absolutely. We we work with, we have an insurance department that works with all the major carriers. So the advantage yep. there is we could find the best insurance carrier for their particular need. So the, the yeah, I mean, we're, we're, is, yeah, we're one of the few banks that uh, does have an insurance uh, brokerage arm. Uh, not all the banks have that. So it's, a, it's an actual uh, service that we provide and, and the credit insurance specifically is a uh, is really important uh, aspect to that, which we have. But insurance is a different, a different uh, regulated industry, you know, where they can where they can do business. So if our insurance guys cannot do it themselves, certainly, again, they have partners as well. They'd be happy to help uh, people on this podcast. Perfect. And, uh, you know, to follow up on this, the same with uh, logistics companies, because uh, Ralph, put a lot of emphasis on the importance of uh, yes. having your bank work with logistics companies. So any any feedback that you can provide on that? Sure, yes. You know, it, it's funny because as a commercial loan officer and an international trade specialist, sometimes we're, we're directing our conversations to different people at the company, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes we, you know, we're meeting with CFOs, CEOs, but we're missing the logistics people, right? Mm -hmm. So the logistics people, when I'm talking trade, those are the people that we, we want to meet with, right? But many times logistics uh, people at the company are doing all of this, this freight forwarding on their own, which mm -hmm. is fine. But interviewing, I would interview a freight forwarder as if you're interviewing an employee of your company, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are freight folders that have advisory services. They do freight folding, but most importantly, they prepare documents. So they're not only doing your freight, but they're also doing your bills of lading, commercial invoices, everything. And it's not that expensive. I don't have a specific price, but you're gonna get a lot of free information from banks, from freight folders and logistics company, and as we mentioned earlier, just quickly, you're going to be able to work with an insurance company and get ratings on your buyers for free when you start adding them to the policy. Perfect. I'm How gonna, great is that? No, it's it's it's, it's perfect. Yeah, and it's uh, I love that um, the fact that, you know, sometimes small business owners uh, don't know these type of services that bank provides, you know? And, uh, yeah, and if you are considering to expand into international markets, I think that's a great resource right there. You know, so yes. yeah. and, and building the relationships with uh, with with your bank for this specific purpose is uh, it's very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we just just to expand on that, we also have you know there are you know small businesses that we work with, 
but we're, we're very capable of working in the middle market space. And we're actually, you know, Ralph and I do it with the large corporate too. So if there's people listening to this podcast that actually work for a, a much larger employee, we're really comfortable with any size company. I mean, multi-billion dollar, you know, revenue companies is not something that's uh, unfamiliar to us, but we're also, you know, really good in the core middle market who people want to take things to the next level. Uh, let me, uh, uh, let me put on screen, uh, this question from Ruben, because I don't, I don't know what he meant by LTV. Maybe you guys know. Can Bali monetize rough rubies valued at 4.4 billion? And if so, what would be the max LTV? Oh, uh, the loan to value. I think okay. Dan, Dan would be able to. Yeah, the, the loan to value. I mean, there's that's kind of a two-part question that lo he looks. He's looking at the foreign exchange. Uh, trade there and he's also looking at uh, it sounds like an investment on his LTV that would probably be a much deeper discussion Com offline if he's uh, yeah so we, we'll, we'll yeah, connect you Ruben with them uh, if you want uh, Ruben I'll, I'll send you the info through LinkedIn uh, so you can connect with uh, Ralph and Dan mm -hmm. um, we are uh, you know like right here like in, in the hour guys uh, anything else that you would like to add before we leave we could go on another three hours. I know. This, this is, is so, yeah. I was so excited, you know, to listen to your presentation because every slide, I'm, I was like, man, I know Ralph can go deeper on this and it will be super valuable to do so. But if you, if you want, you know, we would be, you know, happy to, if you want no, for sure. to stand alone foreign exchange for sure. or that's something we'd love to do. No, oh, for sure. Let's catch it because, um, like I said uh, earlier in the uh, in the uh, conversation, that we do have a, a community of exporters that follow us and businesses mm -hmm. that are considering to go into international markets. So, to provide this valuable information to uh, to our audience is just like a pure goal. Yeah. The the, the only other thing I want to add with regard to the foreign exchange is spot trade. You know, that same day trade is. Uh, doesn't really have a credit exposure to the bank. But if you are trying to go out and lock that in for 30, 60, 90 days, the bank uh, will have credit exposure and there will have to be some due diligence on, on, your, on your company to do that type of product. So there's a little bit of a differential uh, there. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, anything else, uh, Ralph? No, I, I, I appreciate it. I love doing this. This is fantastic. So thank you. Oh, I think thanks, you're doing yeah, me more Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and, think... and listen, even if it's, you know, just to support your podcast, if, if if people just have some questions on where to go and they don't need direction, we're okay with that. Taking, you know, some calls to, to point them in the right direction, even if we can't help ourselves. No, and, and we have a good audience in, in your market. So that's why, you know, okay. it's, 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 uh, it's very valuable for us to have these uh, conversations because we know that there are going to be people benefiting in New Jersey, New York, Illinois, uh, and some of your markets with this information. So thank you so much, guys. Have a great mm -hmm. Friday and a, a very relaxed weekend and look forward to having you on, on the show again. You too. Thank, thank you. For having thank you. Us. Take care.